afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody's doing okay. I've been watching a uh, little bit of the screens uh, going through some of the sites, and it uh, looks like we've got a lot of folks out there tonight uh, that I at least can see. Let's see if we can hear. And uh, let's take a big chance and try to go down to Frederick and see if Gary and the gang can talk to me. Gary. One, two, three, four. I heard you counting, Gary. That's great. Okay, good. I was, I was sure hoping this was working because we had some work done on it. <laughs> well, it sounds like the work was good. Uh, your camera shot, though, is uh, uh, okay. I guess who else is with you there tonight? Uh, Terry's here and Bill is here. Uh, Janine hadn't shown up, but I'm sure she'll be here. Okay, great. Let's try the other mics. Uh, Teresa, will you go ahead and try your microphone? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, that's great. And Bill, how about yours? Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, I can. That's real good. Thank you. Okay. Let's try uh, Carlos over at uh, Okmulgee. Carlos. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Carlos, could you hear uh, Gary and the folks over at Frederick? Yes, sir, I could hear them just great. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's try to get down to Lawrence and Ida Bell. Lawrence, uh, you hit on your microphone and talk to me. Well, nothing coming through yet, Lawrence. I know you're there because I saw you just a little while ago. Uh, we'll see what we can do in terms of getting your microphone up. Try one more time, Lawrence. Okay. Um, let me make a call real quick. Make sure that, er that we can at least, you're getting me. positive that we're on the right side here. Hi. Hi, Kendall. Oh, I'm doing great. I was wondering, can you punch up Ida Bell for me? Just a second. Okay, okay. Lawrence, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, but it's not too, too loud. You might need to get a little closer to the mic. Any better? That's a little better. Okay, uh, Kendall. Uh, do I need? I mean, do you have to punch him up? Apparently, he's not uh, not active. Right. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and leave him on a scan to where at least I, I can see him, and then if I need to talk to him, I'll. I just don't want it to get stuck on him. You know. No, no. Uh, you probably, that's Weatherford, and the, the student at Weatherford is not going over to Frederick. So we're not going to need Weatherford. And I think I, nah, no Bartlesville. Shouldn't have anybody there anyway. Nope. Uh, we should just be at three sites. Okay. Yeah. It gives me everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Mogi, that's right. That's right. Right, right. Okay, Kendall, thanks a lot. Bye. Okay, y'all, looks like we're in pretty good shape tonight. Uh, we'll be able to get to Lawrence, but I'll have to get a little technical assistance to get there. But it looks like we're all together, and even Godfrey's here tonight. Godfrey, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. All right, good to see you. And uh, Godfrey's doing real well tonight. Uh, everyone, we've got a little bit of a tight agenda tonight. We're going to move a little bit quickly. Uh, let me give you kind of a advanced organizer. Um, I hope that... If, well, I ought to check first just to see because this will make an impact. Um, did, how many of you, I and mean, just kind of raise your hand uh, when I call on you, if you've got your materials in the 
mail, then either say uh, no you did not or yes you did and let's start over at Carlos. Did you get your materials? Uh, yes, I did. Hey. Yes, I did. Oh, you did get, okay, you're going to tell me. Okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, let's go out, out to Frederick and hold on a second, guys. Let me see you first. I should see you. Okay, did you all get your materials? No? That looks like a no vote out there. Yes. And, yeah, uh, we got our materials. Oh, oh you did? Okay, good. Okay, yeah, Bill got no. yours. Okay. Uh, Janine, did you get yours, Janine? Yes, I got mine. I think Terry's the only one that did not receive paper or materials. Okay, okay. You might have to share a uh, handout with her then tonight because uh, we're going to be uh, using the handout as a uh, reference. Uh, that I sent to you. And Lawrence, I hope you got yours. And uh, if not, I've got a lot of it on the PowerPoint. We'll go from there. First thing I want to do, though, this evening is I want to consider case study number three. So if you have not, uh, or rather, if you don't have that out, go ahead and take a minute and uh, take out case study number three. We're going to look at that first thing out of the block. And then after that, uh, we're going to mention a couple of things that we ended with last week on the um, role of the counselor in uh, this system, again, to integrate academic and vocational education. And then we're going to hit probably most of class tonight, again, with the topic of the different models uh, of integration. And some of that is in the first handout I gave you, and some of that is in the reading uh, in uh, Grubb's Education Through Occupation in American High Schools. And we'll get to that this evening, OK? Uh, also, I want to talk briefly right now about uh, your midterm examination. Uh, the midterm is scheduled in two weeks. Uh, I am going to be sending you a study guide uh, for the midterm, and uh, I will be sending the midterm to your site, and uh, I will make arrangements for someone at your site uh, to actually give you the examination at, during class time period uh, two weeks from tonight and you will have the period to take the exam, and then the exam will be sent back to me. And that's all we'll do uh, two weeks from now. But I'll send you a study guide, and also uh, next week uh, we'll spend some time in terms of reviewing uh, just to make sure that you study the right material to get ready for the exam. Uh, the exam, uh, I haven't written it up yet, but I'll tell you that I will ask a variety of questions. Uh, I'll ask you some regular objective questions, kind of like some, a few true and false, and, uh, multiple choice, uh, and then I'll ask you probably uh, some uh, short answer questions. I'll ask you to comment. Uh, I'll probably also give you a, a kind of like a case study uh, for you to comment on and answer questions about, and then I'll probably ask you an essay question, uh, and uh, there will be, uh, again, a chance for some bonus points on the exam. Uh, one of the things that I always do is I have uh, hidden bonus questions. Uh, you won't know which questions they are. I learned a long time ago that uh, usually when you uh, put bonus questions on a test, uh, a lot of students don't even answer it. Uh, so I, I decided not to tell students which, which questions were and uh, the bonus ones, and they ended up doing a pretty good job uh, of answering all the tests anyway and hoping to get the bonus as well. So. Uh, I imagine, again, that uh, the examination should not take you the entire class period. Uh, again, if hopefully we can get started on time around 6.30 or so, uh, you should be able to be finished by 8.30, I would say, at the latest. And many of you will probably finish before that time. Uh, I would say it's probably somewhere between an hour to an hour and a half. I will, but most of you will probably finish the exam. But again, you do have all three hours to take the exam if you would like to spend that amount of time. Uh, on that particular evening, uh, which I believe is October the 16th, uh, I myself will not be here in the studio. Uh, Bill Swieger, who uh, is a doctoral student and also teaches our Monday night class and the foundations of TNI education will be here in my place. Uh, that week of October the 13th, I've been asked by OSU to go recruiting. And uh, so I'm, there, I'm going down to South Texas uh, my uh, home stopping grounds and visit four different
different colleges and universities in uh, hopes to recruit uh, more Hispanic students uh, to OSU and in particular to the graduate programs uh, for the entire university. And so I'm, uh, I'm going to be making the, the rounds. I'll start at Corpus Christi. Some of you may know where that is and uh, be visiting my alma mater there, Corpus Christi State. Now it's Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And then I'll go to uh, Kingsville, uh, home of the King Ranch, and my other alma mater, who it was Texas A&I, and now it's Texas A&M at Kingsville. And then I'll go down to the Rio Grande Valley, where I grew up, and visit University of Texas at Pan American, in Edinburgh, Texas, and University of Texas at Brownsville. Uh, four different schools and four different days. Uh, but I guess I can, I can do it. I guess somebody's got to do it. So I'll be, I'll be going down there. And again, during that week, again, uh, that is uh, midterm, just so happened to fell that way, so it, it's not a problem. And uh, then the week after that, uh, we start up. Now, I, I do want to cause your attention that the week after that, we will not have class, okay? That's real important. The week after that, we will not have class because of fall break. Fall break occurs on that Monday and Tuesday, and let me get my calendar out just to uh, make sure I give you the right dates. October the 20th and 21st is fall break here at OSU. And what that means is that that Wednesday the 22nd, okay, Wednesday the 22nd, the Monday night classes will meet during that Wednesday night. So in other words, if you're taking a Monday night class, you should attend that class on, on Wednesday, okay? So we will not meet on October 22nd. The next time we would meet is going to be the week after that, which is October the 29th. And again, that's also noted in your syllabus, if you'll look at the dates of the class meetings, that the 22nd is not listed. So uh, again, please uh, make sure that you make that notation. So. I won't see you for a while after next week, but uh, uh, you'll be in my heart and in my spirit as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and consider uh, case, uh, case study number three. And as a little bit of a review about the case study, um, it talks about a, a magnet school by the name of Future Horizons Career Center. And uh, what's kind of important about this, this case study is that this magnet school includes both academic and vocational teachers. And as the case study starts out, uh, it talks about how the principal, uh, Ms. Fazio, has uh, been granted uh, a uh, program from a proposal that she submitted to the State Department. And uh, this was going to allow uh, some special projects uh, for the teachers. And it does, in that second paragraph on page one, it does talk about the school and the faculty and that they had prided themselves in student preparation, uh, that the students who completed the programs had gained great technical skills, variety of employment opportunities in all different kinds of fields. And again, you had uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors at this school. And again, they got both academic and vocational. Now, I thought it was kind of interesting that, that in the next paragraph they noted that when the faculty came in for the faculty meeting, that their typical uh, pattern was that the vocational teacher sat on one side of the room and the academic teacher sat on the other. Um, has anyone ever experienced that? You know, has anyone been in the school where that's actually, you've experienced that? I guess not, because no one's no one's uh, uh, telling me anything. Uh, my again, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Recently, we had a meeting here at this Tech where we had all of the area school teachers come to a meeting uh, with vocational teachers, and that did happen. Uh, all the vocational teachers sat in a group in the back of the room, and all the uh, academic teachers sat on the other side. So the vocational teacher sat in the back of the room? It was easier to get away. Easier to get away, huh? Okay. Well, uh, that, you know, sometimes that's pretty typical, teaching groups kind of come together like that. Um, and in a way, sometimes you 
some people might say it's kind of natural that teachers who are part of a group kind of have a tendency to be together in, in, in different settings, let's say. Uh, and it's not necessarily a sign of, of uh, anything bad, but, you know, I, I think as the case study goes on, you can see that there was some division, but that is true. I taught at a comprehensive high school uh, for 10 years in which we had both academic and vocational programs, and when we would have a faculty meeting, uh, this kind of arrangement kind of was the case. It wasn't so dramatic to where one was on one side and one was on the other, but, you know, there was a a definitely vocational education group, you know, that was in a particular area, uh, and there wasn't a whole lot of intermingling. But uh, anyway, I thought that was an interesting thing. And, and again, they had a, they had gotten together in this uh, case study, and they started talking about the new funds that were going to be available. And uh, it was interesting to know that the vocational teachers talked about equipment, the academic teachers talked about resource material and computers. Uh, you know, each each group talking about their own needs. And then the uh, principal says, and, or starts talking about the funds, and that they were going to have to form teams of academic and vocational teachers to align curriculum so that the students' communication skills would be improved. And that's an important part there because that sets the focus of this kind of project. Uh, the math and science teachers uh, gave a sigh of relief, I guess, here. And even though they wouldn't get extra funds, at least they wouldn't be involved in rewriting their curriculums and changing their instruction. Uh, many of the vocational teachers did likewise, thinking that little would be required of them since the communication skills were hardly focused in their instruction. And they, of course, concentrated on the technical skills and not those communication skills. And on the second page, again, the, the principal continues to talk about this. And uh, then uh, they kind of realize that, hey, she was really talking about everybody, all the teachers, regardless of what they taught. And uh, she told them that uh, this was, again, a proposal that had been based from the school's advisory committee, and that uh, this was a very important, let's say, uh, set of skills that the employers had indicated that they wanted the, the school to address. And uh, it required workers to communicate more than ever on the workplace. So based upon this report and uh, two other vocational teachers that they mentioned here, she wrote the proposal and got the money. Now the teachers uh, were supposed to develop a project according to the principal, and it would have to go across their classes. And we've kind of talked about this kind of uh, model. And uh, again, all teachers would be involved. The vocational teachers looked across the room and the academic teachers looked across the room and, and, and said they were thinking, well, you're not going to step on my toes. You're not going to start changing what's in my territory. And uh, the two vocational teachers that have been part of this report, I, according to this, kind of were surprised that this had this kind of impact, this kind of reaction from the, from the teachers. Uh, and so again, as the meeting got to a close, the principals told the teachers they were going to form teams that, uh, of course, some teachers were more receptive than others, and some of them felt comfortable with it, and some of them were not. And then a few said that they were going to do this, and others said they were not, and so the, the principal is going to have to assign them to a team. And uh, some of the teachers said here, since many of the teachers not wanting change ended up on teams together. Now think about that. You know, You've got a, a, a group of folks who are saying, no, I don't want to do this. And what happens, we put those people together. You know, that's cool. All right. Let's put all the ones that don't want to change together. I'm sure that's helpful. Uh, Ellen uh, asked them to, for the next faculty meeting that each team present some suggested ways that curriculum could be aligned between vocational and academic courses as required for the use of the funds. And then she distributed a, a copy of the proposal. Uh, three weeks later, uh, maybe not to your surprise, nor to mine, uh, some of the teams, I guess, who had been working, they started to sit together. Okay, now we get a, a little difference in seating arrangement and behavior according to the uh, case study. And uh, while others kept their old habits, uh, academic teachers on the right, vocational teachers on the left, a uh, variety of comments were heard and the examples, uh, one of the electronics teachers said, uh, that if this plan for integration began before classes started, my blood pressure wouldn't be so high. Excuse me, another teacher who taught English on the, on 
the next page says uh, uh, this is not working. The vocational teachers don't see any need to change, and I don't either. And then a business teacher uh, commented that uh, students need these communication skills before they come to my class. And then finally, a home economics teacher said, I'm already doing this. I always have. So then, when it was time for the committee reports on what changes might be feasible there at the school to align curriculum, teachers mostly gave reasons, uh, I might say excuses, uh, for why they shouldn't change. And one of the communities, or two committees, excuse me, reported that they did not see how they could conduct a project that they had not designed. And that's an interesting point there for you to think about. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a chance to uh, consider these questions and answers. And rather than doing all of the questions, I want you to consider uh, particular ones. I want you to consider uh, question number four, number five, and number six. And I want to give you a few minutes, uh, those of you at Frederick, to uh, talk amongst yourselves and think about uh, possible answers. And again, Lawrence and Carlos, and here we have Godfrey, I want you to consider again your responses to questions four, five, and six. And so let's take about five minutes and or, or so and think about your answers, discuss with Frederick, and we'll come right back to you in a few minutes. Okay. Well, I messed up, Jerry. Uh, yeah. I did. He mailed us that handout, and I forgot to bring it with me, so I hope we don't have to use it. <laughs> Is that the one he's talking about? I don't know. One of them. The question four, five. No, six. that's. I've got that. It's just. Uh, oh. I forgot the handout that he mailed us in the mail with our grades. Ah. I didn't think of it. I didn't get it in my briefcase. I was. I looked all over for it, but. Oh well. Maybe during break, if we get a 15 minute break, I might just make a bonsai run to the house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you probably won't need it. Yeah, that probably. <laughs> what, do you, what do you say about the test and everything? He's going to make arrangements for the test. Like for someone here, or maybe you, I guess, to give me the test and keep an eye on me, make sure I don't cheat or whatever. And okay. Is that also the night Swigger's going to? Yeah, that's the night Swigger's going to take over the class for us. Maybe he's going to sit there and watch over you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> give it to you and wonder how we're going to get it back. <laughs> well, I don't know. I guess you could send a self stamp envelope or something. Yeah, maybe that's the case. Could be interesting. Yeah, sure, good.
Bell, can you just keep it for me for a while? Can you okay, hear me? I'll call you back. Okay, thanks. Can you hear uh, me? Yeah, Lawrence, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Lawrence. Uh, uh, by the way, before you before you get away, I didn't receive the handout. I did not. You haven't it. received it yet. Okay. Hopefully, you'll get it tomorrow because uh, they okay. were all mailed together. Okay. Okay, Lawrence, uh, and I will repeat Lawrence's answers just in case folks at Frederick and other places can't hear him. Uh, Lawrence, let me ask you, uh, how do you respond to question number six? Uh, question says, uh, how could the teacher's hostility toward the project have been avoided? And it gives an example about maybe having them uh, involved in the writing of the proposal. How else might their hostility have been avoided? Well, I think being involved in writing proposal was uh, would be very important. It would make them feel uh, more involved, more included, uh, probably more important. And they would also feel that they were part of the decision making too. So basically you're saying that the, the example that is given there is a pretty good, pretty good idea to have them involved in the proposal writing so that that way they could maybe feel it came from them yeah, I would think that would take away a little of the bitterness if they would have a little bit of input in the uh, proposal writing. If you gave them the chance also to, in, to, to get themselves involved in the proposal writing, um, what other kinds of issues do you think might have been brought up? You get the pros and cons from both sides, you know, what they fear and uh, from the vocational as well as academic teachers what they fear and things that they think that they could work together and uh, and uh, be uh, in agreement in. Right. I think that's a good point. Uh, uh, Lawrence was talking about it would have an opportunity for the teachers to have a chance to voice their concerns and their fears, uh, give them an opportunity to go ahead and maybe talk about some things that they didn't feel good about ahead of time. Uh, to be able to help them get over any, any conflict. Uh, let's try to go over to uh, Ophelge and Carlos. Uh, any other ideas on question number six? Uh, how else could have we uh, avoided this hostility? Uh, I basically I agree with Lawrence what he said and just keeping the teachers more informed as to what was really happening and what was expected of them uh, to listen to their views you know, find out what they thought was a problem, try to get it corrected, uh, get them more informed or, uh, or better educated on why they needed to integrate and how it was going to, how they were going to actually benefit from it, from that, sorry. Okay, uh, I, I, uh, every once in a while your audio was a little hard to hear that time, Carlos, but I think I got most of it to where you were mentioning that uh, probably giving the teachers a chance to talk about it ahead of time uh, would have maybe avoided some of the problems than just being hit with it all at once. Is that is that about right? Yes, sir. That's right. Okay, good. Good. That's better. Thank you. Now let's try to go down to Frederick uh, and uh, ask Janine and and her cohorts uh, how they feel about this. Janine, can you go ahead and tell me what your discussion was about?
letting them kind of set the example for the rest of the teachers and maybe bring on some of the other teachers ahead of time. But having the opportunity to talk about it beforehand, I think uh, definitely was a good idea. Maybe we can avoid some of the hostility. Uh, good point. Uh, Godfrey, do you have anything to add to that, or has everything been said? I think the, the same uh, what they have already said concerning giving them the problem at the, at the beginning. And after they have worked over it, and they did them now the project. I think that will help. Good. Uh, I think that's true. I mean, uh, I think all of us that work in the schools uh, like to try to be involved in the beginning of projects. Uh, so when it does happen, we feel more like it's ours rather than somebody imposing this on us. Let's look at question number five, and we'll start with Bill out there. And Frederick, uh, Bill, the question says, uh, why should some academic and vocational teachers welcome this change while others might resist it? Bill, what were, what were the ideas you all talked about? Uh, one of the things that we talked about was the fact that uh, probably some of the older teachers were pretty, pretty well set in their ways and they weren't uh, willing to have a change, whereas some of the newer teachers that were coming in possibly would have a uh, more of an insight on going ahead and integrating these. And uh, we thought probably by uh, using the younger teachers would probably be able to integrate it better than if we had, you know, some of the other teachers that were set in their ways and, and didn't want to change. All right. Uh, Bill's point, again, being that uh, uh, perhaps some, let's say, veteran teachers uh, may not be as open to change as perhaps some of the uh, younger whippersnappers who are just entering the profession and don't know what it's all about anyway. Uh, and so maybe their, their attitude about change might be a little bit different. Let me uh, just make a, re a remark uh, about, uh, and I think I've told you this in class, but if not, you know, I'll, I'll let you know now. The last uh, three years, uh, I've been working on a special project uh, with Tulsa Technology Center uh, that is, is somewhat related to the integration of academic and vocational education, but the main uh, project is based on converting uh, their courses at the various technology centers uh, to an open entry, open exit uh, type of format. Instead of having a, a lockstep method, uh, they're converting their courses so that adults or high schoolers could come in really into the program any time so that means it's got to be all individualized, uh, very much a strong emphasis on learning activity packages and a change in the role of the teacher. <clears throat> but as part of this project, again, we've had a variety of teachers uh, take, uh, play, or, or, or take part in the project. And we have noticed that the newer or younger or, uh, uh, let's say, teachers that are, have a few years of experience are much more open uh, to this new design for them than, let's say, some of the more veteran teachers. And that may perhaps be just uh, a characteristic of change, but uh, maybe individual. Because we've had some veteran teachers have embraced it and really run with it, and it's been real good for them as well. So that's a good point. Uh, Carlos, any other ideas about why some teachers would welcome it and some teachers would resist it? Uh, I believe uh, some of the instructors may also notice that hey we're going to get more funding out of this and we'd like to integrate so i think that'd be great for our program uh let's see what else do i have here uh and others that uh, again the same people that are positive about it they're going to see the need for integration They'll, they're going to want to do it uh, and those that don't see the need obviously don't want to do it but uh, i think they could be convinced once that they, they see that they're not trying to take away from their program that they're just trying to add to it all right, it's a real good, I, it's a real good point, Carlos. So Carlos makes two, two very important points. One that's associated with need. Uh, if, if the teachers don't see a need to change, then uh, chances are they may not be very willing to do so. So the need has got to be established. Now, in this case study, I think the principal tries to make the case for need when she connects it to what the advisory committee says. 
and that the advisory committee says we need these communication skills, but I, it may not have been strong enough. Uh, what might have been more powerful in terms of establishing that need? Uh, I'll go to Gary. Gary, what might have been more powerful in establishing that need? I think when you talk about establishing the need, that uh, part of what I could, we may have missed here is that you know you have teachers are a control group, and uh, especially someone that's been there, they're they're wanting to control the situation. They control the classroom, they control their curriculum, whether it be uh, you know. So to me, the, that is that is even a larger part of it. Instead of the the need is the, is their their need to control something and. Uh, that you uh, you find them you know they if they don't have control or it's not their own idea that uh, it's not the need's not there for any change. I think that's an excellent point. Uh, uh, teachers, in a way, are in a way kind of control control freaks, and uh, as some people might say. Uh, and if the need isn't strong enough, and if they haven't been involved in how am I going to be involved in this, then there might be two large barriers there uh, that prevent people from getting uh, involved. I think in terms of maybe making the need more powerful, uh, perhaps it might have been good to actually have some of the advisory committee there with the principal and let them express this idea to the teachers. Uh, let them tell the teachers, you know, you're doing a real good job. Uh, we like what you're doing in the classroom. But we think we need some added emphasis here, and we want you to, you know, consider doing this. And this is how we're going to give you an opportunity to try it. And maybe that might have been able to impress uh, some of the teachers. Certainly not all of them, as Gary points out. There's some other factors involved. Uh, but I, I think maybe that might have been able to, you know, maybe uh, make the issue or the need a little bit stronger. And. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, let's go ahead and go to uh, question number four. And question number four says, how, how can vocational academic teachers help each other get started with the task of integrating curriculums? And I'll start here in the studio with Godfrey. Uh, Godfrey, what, what was your idea about uh, this, this, the answer to this question number four? Uh, on this question, uh, I had two. I said one was uh, helping each other explain it then possibly working in teams. And out of that, find ways to help each other. Uh, once you ask the teachers to work in a team, and you have academic and vocational teacher there, uh, what could they do to maybe get started? Where, how could they get started in terms of this project? Uh, it's by, uh, I thought it was by uh, both of them sharing their uh, project then each one should look into his, uh, his neighbor and see what they are doing. And if I can help them. Okay, good, good point. Uh, remember, the focus of this project is communication skills, right? So if a vocational teacher can say, well, in my profession or in my area, this is where communication skills are used the most. And then the academic teacher might say, okay, well, in the area that I teach, whether it be history or English or mathematics, you know, uh, where, where is communication important here? And is it oral communication? Is it written communication? Is it body language? There's all kinds of forms of communication. And so different forms of communication might be able to be shared amongst teachers for them to get started. Um, Teresa, did you all have any other points down there on question number four? Well, we uh, did talk a little bit about giving time for the teachers to visit other classes and then do some co-teaching. Maybe have a science teacher go in and teach a unit on the health science technology program or vice versa. You know, have the health science teacher uh, go over and help teach maybe some anatomy, but do some co-teaching. That's excellent. That's excellent. Good, good example of having teachers uh, visit each other's classes and, and then maybe even beginning to figure out how 
they can help each other uh, either through co-teaching or maybe team teaching, uh, providing each other with some resources and some materials. And that, that's, that's uh, an excellent point in terms of trying to get things started. Uh, it's hard to get started sometimes when I don't have anything to start from, whereas if I can offer you an idea or I can show you some examples or I can actually even give you a unit or a lesson that's already kind of designed in that area and then we can adapt it and modify it uh, to fit the students and fit the topic, then we can get started on it. That's, that's the real issue of that. In the uh, in-services that I've done with groups of teachers, you know, getting them started sometimes is a real, uh, uh, let's say, hurdle to get over. Once they've gotten over that and they get started, then some of the ideas start coming out and people start saying, oh, well, if I did this and if you did that and we can do this together, then it really begins to uh, grow and, and sometimes snowball with a lot of really good ideas to do this. I think if we look at the case study as, as a whole, there was probably a few mistakes and I think you uh, uh, should pointed them out. It probably would have been good to have the teachers involved in the beginning or at least a group of teachers uh, that let's say volunteered or may have been asked to be on the team to write the proposal, uh, to meet with the advisory committee. We had two vocational teachers uh, that was mentioned in the case study. It would have been nice to have at least two academic teachers as well. Uh, so that, that way, again, you've got people from both sides of the aisle. But I think, as you mentioned, probably we needed more to be involved so that could have some ownership. Uh, also, I think that ha having all teachers be mandated to do that is a pretty hard, uh, pretty hard road to hoe. Uh, I think that uh, if you can start out with those who really want to give it a try, as was suggested, a, a couple of pilot programs, getting them started, seeing the success that that happens, and then slowly growing, it would probably be a good thing to do. Uh, and also, I think, uh, again, having teachers being able to work a little bit uh, with each other beforehand, uh, giving them three weeks to say, okay, let's get on to it. The case study doesn't tell us exactly how the uh, school or the administrators facilitated the teachers to get together. Could they do it during their planning period? Uh, you know, were they given time to be able to sit in each other's classes? We don't know. The case study doesn't give us that information. Uh, but hopefully those kinds of things would have been helpful uh, for the teachers to work together. Also, I think uh, it's important for us to kind of recognize the climate. You know, obviously you've got a situation where your academic and vocational uh, faculties have not worked together simply because of how they're sitting and what they're thinking. And then what they're saying at the end of this case study, uh, those three or four kinds of remarks to me are, uh, remind me of, uh, sometimes my children talking about why they can't do things. And uh, uh, being faced with this at a school, uh, you probably want to say, uh, time out and let's try to do something else, okay? Um, on the final page, and we didn't look at the questions on the next page, but question number seven says, how could the teacher teams have been formed so that they would have been more functional? And I think we already kind of addressed that. Uh, maybe by asking for volunteers uh, to work together. Also, in one of the other case studies, remember they matched some teachers that were for it and some teachers that were against it and kind of put them together in a team so that that way they could exchange ideas and talk about it and maybe persuade each other. That might have been a, a good way to go for it. Uh, and then uh, some of the lessons we've learned, I think uh, we've kind of talked a little bit about it in the case study there. So uh, I think this is a, a, a good one for us to consider. I think it's fairly typical of a lot of uh, places around the country where, again, teachers are just beginning to get together in terms of integration. Um, what I'd like to do now real briefly is, is I'd like to uh, go to, uh, let me see, your handout. And uh, it is the handout that I sent you the first time that uh, kind of looks like this. Right? Emphasis for integration. Let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, emphasis for integrating academic. That's the first handout that I gave you or that I sent to you this year. And on that handout, if you'll look at uh, the next to last page on that handout, it starts talking about the various stages of integration. Now, I want you to make a distinction between stages and models, uh, because the, the models and the stages really kind of come together a little bit sometimes. And what this page is meant to do is meant to kind of show, let's say, an evolutionary process.
simple integration, the very in-depth and complex integration. And so uh, basically I'll, I'll entitle this uh, Approaches to Integrating Academic and Vocational Education or uh, How to Mix It Up. You know, how do, we, how do we get the mix going here in terms of integration? And when we talk about the stages, the first stage on your page uh, is entitled Basic Infusion Stage. And underneath it, it talks about incorporating academic content into vocational courses, you know? Uh, incorporating academic content into vocational courses. And you should probably notice here that this is pretty much a one-way street. In other words, many times at schools and in programs, the first, let's say, step in the integration process is where we start infusing greater academic learning in some of the vocational curricula. So we'll do a little more math or more science or communication uh, types of lessons, learning, assignments within the vocational program itself or vocational curriculum, okay? Uh, then the second, uh, oops, let me go ahead and change that, sorry. The second stage is called the advanced infusion stage. And here we've gone a little bit further and we've got both vocational and academic teachers beginning to work together to integrate the academic skills and their vocational classes. So this makes a big step in the integration evolution where we've got both stages or both kinds of teachers working together, integrating academic skills and vocational classes together. Uh, that is, I think, a, a real important, uh, let's say, stage or characteristic to get to, is when we start getting the teachers to work together. That, that's real important. The next one is stage three. And stage three is called the applied academics. Now, the, underneath you'll see, oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Applied academics have where vocational curricula remains intact while academic curriculum are modified to incorporate the vocational applications. Now I've added a couple of things that you do not have on your handout uh, right here on my screen. And that begins right here because this kind of approach can, certainly can be a standalone course such as applied mathematics or principles of technology or applied communication. Or we can take units from that applied math and incorporate those units into our vocational programs by themselves, okay, in this applied academic stage. Now, one of the things I want you to notice here is that it says that the vocational curriculum remains intact while the academic curriculum is modified. And that's kind of the opposite, let's say, or the counterpart of stage number one. Stage number one is where the vocational curriculum changed, the academic stayed the same. In my mind, the opposite is almost, or the counterpart is here in stage three, where we have the vocational program pretty much staying the same, and the academic beginning to change. And out in both your textbooks uh, that is used as a primary vehicle to do this. And as I mentioned, it can either be a standalone course or one that's incorporated into the vocational program. If it's incorporated into the vocational program, then it does change the vocational curriculum uh, a little bit. Stage number four is really getting into a more complex kind of evolution, and that is called curriculum alignment. And here, uh, schools rely heavily, and uh, emphasize the word heavily here, rely heavily on teacher collaboration to modify both the vocational and academic curriculum. And both are designed to reinforce the other. Reinforce is a very important word there. Both are designed to reinforce the other laterally and sequentially. Now, those are very, two very important descriptors that I think we need to make sure that we understand what they mean. Laterally and sequentially. When we say we want to reinforce learning laterally, uh, what do you think we mean by that? Uh, let's give the folks in Frederick a chance to respond. Uh, group, what do, you, what do you think we mean by reinforcing laterally?
a vocational teacher to the academic teacher uh, where their courses align laterally across from one from the vocational or technical to the academic part. Okay, I think you're 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 right on target there in terms of saying uh, one course to another course to another course uh, that happens simultaneously. In other words, in one day, uh, if I went to my English class and then I went to let's say my carpentry class, and the same kind of mathematics are being reinforced on the same day, uh, and then I go let's say to my uh, social studies class, and they're using the same kinds of, let's say, um, math to figure out demographics or some kind of, of uh, let's say, uh, facts and figures about people or society, then it becomes something that happens laterally across the curriculum. Sequentially, then, could be across time. For example, Let's say that in a mathematics class, we talk about the use of decimals during, let's say, a particular week. But during that week in my, let's say, TV production class, I'm not at decimals yet, but I'll be there the next week. So that way, the student learns the basics about decimals in the math class, comes to my class the next week, and then I call, okay, last week in math, I know you guys got decimals, now we're going to work on them in terms of time and how to figure out time using decimals based on the foundation that you've already learned in that math class last week. So I, we reinforce the learning and maybe I apply the mathematical principles that came the week before. And that would be more in a sequential kind of reinforcement. So laterally, we're doing it simultaneously Sequentially, we're doing it maybe one after the other, but in a pattern where those skills, again, are reinforced as they go through a learning cycle, and maybe even learning different lessons at that time, okay? So that's an important distinction, and Bill, thanks a lot for your answer. That, that really helped a lot. The final stage on this page is called a restructured school, and uh, this indeed is the most complex and in your textbook Grubb uh, has some good examples about the restructuring and a lot of times uh, the restructuring is associated with, with what's called the academy model or a, I'll put a little quotation mark up here, see if I can do this, I get a little better at this y'all, uh, schools within a school. And for those of you that maybe are not familiar with this concept of a school within a school, is kind of like if, if you had, again, at your particular campus, another little campus within it that concentrated in a particular area of specialization. So I will make the analogy of the university. We have Oklahoma State University. That is, you could say, one school. But within Oklahoma State University, you've got the College of Engineering, the College of Education, College of Agriculture, and that college is like a school within the school of OSU. Sometimes there will be courses that will be shared among schools, and many times there's a whole body of courses that will be only in that school. So if I am a student, let's say, in the College of Veterinary Medicine, chances are I will be taking some mathematics classes and some biology classes and some science classes that everybody else will take regardless of what school they're in, and that's OSU. But then there's going to be some very specific classes that I'm going to take in veterinary medicine that will only be in my school, and that's what makes my school unique and is a school within a larger school. Now, Take that idea and put it in at a high school or even at a vocational technical center and use the idea of a career as the theme to organize those schools. And so what we've got is we've got teams of teachers. And this is a real, oh, God, look at that. That was terrible. Let me get that out of the way. We've got teams of teachers. 
you like to do that better, y'all. Start doing this left-handed, especially when you're right-handed. <laughs> Teams of teachers working with groups of students in an occupational cluster or specialty. So we form a team of teachers in a school, and we've got both academic and technical teachers in this school. And we form them around an occupational cluster, communication, manufacturing, health occupation. And we say, in that area, you're going to teach all that is needed to be taught in that school. And then we may have some courses that all students across schools may take together. Because some of the, uh, let's say, criticisms of the academy model is that the school, the whole school, the large school, kind of loses its sense of spirit, loses its sense of identity if you do not have courses that all students take regardless of what school they're in. Uh, in Tulsa, this is one, uh, a, and it just so happens I, I was able to uh, get in contact because I did a supervision of a Spanish teacher, and why they picked me, I'll never know. But I had to go and uh, supervise a Spanish teacher at a junior high, actually a middle school there. And the middle school was designed around this model of a school within the school. And each school had its own name, and each school, the, the, the students together, like they made a motto for their school, and they designed their own flag, and, and uh, they made colors for their own school. And, and these were out in the hallways and, and, and different parts of the school, of the, the campus, uh, you know, actually kind of belonged to those schools. And it was kind of neat in a way because you could see where the students really identified with their school and also yet at the same time identified with the campus at large and really made a stronger bond with their teachers because they were with those teachers again over the entire three years that they were at the middle school, which covered sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So in all three years, they had the same group of teachers, okay, that were coming through. And so you stayed with those students. It wasn't like one year, which is very common in academic education, you've got a student for one year, maybe even only one semester, then you just kind of pass them off. So if you have trouble with them, it's kind of like, oh, if I can just hang on another three months, they'll be gone. Well, you can't do it like that in the academy model because the student's going to stay there, and you've got to find an answer. You've got to find a solution to any kind of conflict that may happen. And really what it does is it really, I think, helps people to work together and to find solutions uh, for their problems. So let me go back to the uh, to the. Uh, stages here. And matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and put them over here where we can see them uh, all in all on my camera up here. And let me zoom in just a little bit. Now, I, let me make one comment here. Oops, I kind of messed up on that one. Uh, I'm going to have to, excuse me, y'all, I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to do something real quick. I kind of uh, made a, a, a technical boo-boo there. I accidentally hit the uh, unfocused button. So it's not going to look too well. So let me go ahead and make sure it looks better here. That's better. Okay, here we go. Uh, and this again is what you have in front of you, I hope. Uh, let me say it in my own opinion here that this is not necessarily has to happen in this order, but more than likely it, it kind of does, okay, in this respect. I think that when people start with basic infusion up here, where we're just, you know, trying to get uh, more academics into the vocational programs. A lot of people start that way because it might be easier to start than starting, let's say, uh, with another form and to get people together. The applied academics, though, this is where it says stage three. I have known schools to start there. Actually start with applied academics. They, they get the applied curriculum. They put it in as either standalone courses or they get academic teachers and vocational teachers to take parts of that and put it in their own programs. So I guess what I'm telling you is that I don't think necessarily
way. But I will say this, is that it's very difficult to start here with curriculum alignment, because you've got to have a lot of teachers who really want to do it. And sometimes it's a lot easier to say, okay, let's start with applied academics or, or let's start with the advanced infusion where we have both academic and vocational teachers working together and let's work toward curriculum alignment and maybe even later we can reach perhaps a restructured school that really allows the integration to occur, okay? But what I really want you to understand is I want you to understand these different kinds of stages or, or, or let's say developmental stages that can occur when we're integrating academic and vocational education, okay? Uh, any any questions uh, from anyone? Uh, Carlos, any questions on your end? Uh, no, sir, not yet. Are you okay, Carlos? Say again. Uh, no, sir, not yet. No questions at this time. Okay. Uh, Frederick, uh, questions or responses? Well, uh, we, we don't have any at this time. Okay, good. And Lawrence, I'll get to you. I don't know if I'm being watched by Kendall and the folks there in uh, Master Control, but Kendall, if you're watching me now, can you punch up Lawrence rather than trying to get you on the telephone uh, and see if Lawrence has any questions. Lawrence, try to talk to me. And we'll get to Lawrence after the break, okay? Let's go ahead and take a break right now, y'all. I've got about 15 till 8 o'clock. Uh, let's come back at 8 o'clock on the button, okay? So uh, we'll come back at 8 and continue. Let's see if I can find my break sheet. There it is. Let's have a break. Well, I think it's worth the bonsai run to the house to get that paper. <laughs> go for work. Five minutes after 8. after eight so we're about ready to start again and hope you had a good break yeah. we're going to push forward now and I want to uh, refer to you now to the next page in the handout uh, where it lists eight different models of integration and I believe this is the last page on the first handout that I sent to you in the mail and what I'd like to do is briefly kind of go each through each one of these models and uh, talk about some of the uh, nuances. I think we're getting familiar enough with them uh, based on a previous discussion and hopefully you're reading uh, to where we don't have to uh, spend a whole lot of time, but it is important for you to look at the distinction that is made uh, in this particular study. By the way, uh, this particular handout uh, comes from a study that was initiated uh, at uh, Colorado State University a few years ago, uh, funded through the National Center for Vocational Education Research where they went out uh, into the field and looked at how different schools were approaching uh, the integration of academic and vocational education and then based on the information and, and knowledge that they got they were able to put together these different models or approaches so to speak. So uh, let's go ahead and start with our first model and that's model number one and it's very much like our first stage if you look at our stages as well uh, and that's incorporating academic competencies into vocational courses. And uh, the comments that are made on your sheet talk about this being the, the simplest form uh, of integration that can be done, uh, that it has actually related information reinforcement. Now, I'm kind of paraphrasing what your handout says, but it, 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 it was, it's been my experience in vocational education that uh, a lot of the times the academic component that was taught in the technical program was called related information, whether it be math or science or uh, any other kind of information that it, cause it was related to the skill. Uh, but in actuality, in this first model, uh, they kind of deal with it, I think, in a little bit different language. They call it uh, uh, relabeling. Uh, of informal reinforcement of basic academic skills. And uh, I'll just say that uh, we're, again, stressing that uh, related information uh, to reinforce. 
Uh, also, it's, it's a lot of times we can use off-the-shelf packages, uh, pre-produced, uh, let's say, units of instruction, and just kind of incorporate that into the vocational courses. Uh, generally, when we use this approach, it's a very simple, uh, a lower-level academic kind of reinforcement, uh, where, again, it's, it's not high skills or academic skills we're talking about. Our teachers are still separated, and that's a key issue here. Uh, we don't have teachers working together, and uh, basically this approach is going to be taught by the vocational teacher alone uh, without much collaboration, if any, uh, from the academic side. So that's the first model of integration. The second model talks about now uh, combining the academic and vocational teachers, and this is much like a uh, stage in your, your stages from the other pa uh, page. It's called advanced infusion. Uh, here again, the academic teachers initiate some of the teaching uh, and probably of the academic areas as well. In other words, they're actually involved in the teaching in the classes. Uh, academic teachers are assigned maybe to work on site with vocational teachers. And uh, I believe in your handout, it talks about either full time or, or part time. In one of the videotapes that we saw uh, earlier this semester, we saw academic teachers and vocational teachers in the same classroom working together. In the example that I've mentioned here in Oklahoma down in Choctaw, where we have academic teachers who are hired that actually work at the Votech, that work with the academic uh, teachers hand in hand in teaching the mathematics and communications and writing skills, team teaching, co-teaching, providing resources. This is a particular model design that is uh, been used when you have an area vocational school, a magnet school uh, designed like, much like we have here in Oklahoma and in other states as well. So we actually bring the academic teachers in to become part of the staff uh, there at the vocational center. Uh, one of the strengths again of this model is its collaboration. Now we're getting teachers really working together. Uh, the academic skills gain status in the vocational students' eyes. Again, some of the problems when we've talked about this is that the vocational students sometimes don't uh, really value the academic skills, uh, and that can be for a variety of reasons, but they just, you know, they're not really that interested in it, and they don't see the value in it. But when you've got that, that, that strength of collaboration and when your vocational teacher is also emphasizing that we need to learn these skills, then the academics uh, become more important and gain status level. And again, most academic content, unfortunately, though, is still remedial in nature. We're not really advancing students, and sometimes we're helping them come up to where they ought to be. Uh, I think uh, most of us would agree that in many cases in our vocational programs, uh, students are not at, let's say, where they should be in their writing skills, their reading skills, or math skills. Uh, just recently, last week, uh, I had a student teacher that we have teaching out right now as their student teaching experience. Uh, I was talking to the, uh, that student on the telephone and I was just asking how their experience was and how it was going and, and what they saw. And, and uh, one of the comments that the student made to me was that they could not believe the poor writing ability of the high school students that this student had uh, in, in class that uh, the student had asked her students uh, to write uh, just a little bit in class uh, about uh, the subjects, the questions, and she was just, she was shocked. She was shocked at the inability of the students to write. And, uh, and these aren't, you know, what you would call, you know, again, uh, your special ed students. These are, these are normal, regular high school students, but again, uh, Sometimes their ability in the basics, or the old basics, I guess we should say, uh, uh, really are not up to level where they ought to be. And so many times in this approach, not only do we need to reinforce the skills, but sometimes it may even take a remediation nature uh, to help the students come up to the standard or come up to the level where they should be. The third model is in uh, academic curriculum. Uh, again, making it more vocationally relevant. 
the academic curriculum has got to go under some change. And what we do for the academic teachers is that we incorporate more vocational examples. And, and here's where we've really got to uh, work together, uh, where the vocational teacher really makes an effort to, to, to give suggestions, give examples. Uh, perhaps they could come from the applied academic courses again. Uh, the applied academics have uh, lots of examples of where mathematics, science, uh, social studies, communications are used on the job. Uh, sometimes the applied academic courses are substituted for lower level academic courses. I think in one of the first videotapes, uh, one of the principals talked about that they threw away all their basic math classes. Uh, they were ridiculous, you know, math for the living dead kind of thing. And they put in their ap these applied academic courses because they were more relevant and also a little more rigorous as well. And uh, then uh, these applied academics could be used as electives again within the, the program. Uh, this has been a popular form of integration, but very important factor, and that's the last one that's there on your handout, this really needs to be linked to the vocational programs at the school. Uh, that, that's extremely critical. If, if they're just taught without the relationship uh, that is needed, uh, then again, still, the students don't see the connection. Uh, if they can see the connection with the vocational course that they're taking, or a vocational course that they might be interested, or an area that they feel you know, taught, then it becomes more meaningful. Uh, but if it's not applied, then again, this, this kind of instruction perhaps is not as meaningful as it can. So the academic curriculum, we try to infuse the vocational context, uh, and we can do it right in their classes or through the use of the applied academics. Model number four talks about aligning curriculum. And uh, uh, when we align curriculum, that's like when we do that lateral and that sequential connection. Here's where we change the content of both academic and vocational courses. And this is major, right here. This is really a major situation where we ask teachers to come in and do some change. Uh, it coordinates the teachers, uh, uh, we mentioned earlier, either laterally or sequentially, but they're coordinating their instruction either to support each other simultaneously or, again, in some type of a particular sequence or order. That's really important. So we coordinate it. Uh, locally developed or modified off-the-shelf curriculum is what's used. Generally speaking, you can't just go and buy the curriculum and install it with this kind of model. Generally, the teachers have got to work together to make it their own, to make sure it connects what they're doing in their classes, and it connects, again, both up and down, laterally and horizontally and sequentially. And uh, many times it takes some uh, adaptation of curriculum to do that. So they may either do it themselves or it's a possibility they could modify, again, some off-the-shelf. Uh, again, we could use the applied academic curriculum materials as resources. Uh, we've got teacher collaboration and also a new element here in this particular model, and that element is of student mixing. Here, when we align the curriculum, it's much easier to get students from one class and students from another class to kind of work together. Again, I go back to the example of the uh, uh, fish project that I was involved with in South Texas where we're trying to get the biology students and the agriculture students to mix, to come together to form teams across classes, and this is the kind of model that promotes that. And then we should have, hopefully, some cooperative learning going on where students are teaching students. And by the way, that's a key factor that makes cooperative learning different than group learning. A lot of times you'll ask, you'll talk to teachers about cooperative learning, and they say, oh, yeah, I've done it in my class forever. You know, that's one of the comments we had in the case study. Oh, yeah, I already do that. I've been doing it for years. One of the real characteristics of true cooperative learning is students teaching students, okay? Not one student does one thing, another student does another thing, another student does another thing, and then they put it together in one piece. That's, that's tr the traditional kind of group learning or team learning, but it's not cooperative, maybe. 
the students don't cooperate in terms of actually learning something together. And so a cooperative learning model has where a student learns a particular piece of information or a particular skill and teaches that to the other students in their group. And so truly the students learn from each other and that's the real cooperative learning that we really want to take place. And that's got to be designed by the teacher as the facilitator to say, okay, each one of you got to learn a little piece of this, teach each other this piece, and then bring it together in a culminating activity. And again, this could go across classes where the ag students, let's say in the South Texas, could teach the biology students something about the agriculture area. The biology students could then teach the agriculture students something in the biology area, and then they together, after they learn that, then get on the project, okay? So that's the true cooperative spirit and cooperative learning that we want to take place when we talk about that, okay? So I want you to make that distinction. That's a very important distinction to make, okay? Our next model, model number four, or excuse me, number five, talks about the academy. And uh, we, we, we've talked about that extensively, so I'll just uh, kind of briefly go through it again. We've got schools within the school. We've got lots of teacher collaboration. We've got student groups working with teacher groups. And that's kind of a new concept right there from the other models because, again, as we've said, we've got groups of teachers working together with groups of students. And so that interaction is a little bit different. And then the other kind of new element that this one adds is uh, – business and industry partnerships. Now, one of the things I do want to point out here is that business and industry partnership can occur in any of these models. And actually, I recommend that it happens in all of these models, that it's not necessarily just here at the academy. I think it should be in all of them. But it seems like in the research that was conducted that where we found the most involvement of business and industry was in the academy model. There was much more involvement in this model than in the other one. But I want to stress to you that it, that it can be and hopefully should be part of all the other models as well. Okay. Uh, another point was that it motivates potential dropouts to remain. And, and I think really this occurs on all, all the models as well. I've seen it happen with even the basic infusion model, where we've got academics and the vocational, or even the, the more complex models where we've got teachers, you know, uh, students kind of get a little more motivated here, and they have a tendency to want to stay in school rather than choosing uh, to leave school. And uh, what, what one of the points that, again, the researchers make, though, is that when you have the academy model, it doesn't reduce tracking. You know, some people have this big, uh, let's say, objection, and, and I think it's valid to a certain degree that we should not be tracking students. But on the other hand, we've been doing that. <laughs> I mean, when we say we've got a college-bound program, I mean, that's tracking students. We're just tracking them toward college. When we say we've got a vocational, uh, you know, path, we're, we're tracking them. Although people say we don't want to track students, we do it anyway. I mean, it happens. And the big thing is that if we don't have some kind of direction or some kind of pathway, then we end up with what we saw in the Tom Brokaw report with students that don't have a direction and end up just kind of floating around out there and, and sometimes ending up in a lot of trouble. And certainly quality of their life and our life as a society is not one that's enhanced. So it's really a, something that we've got to deal with. But this particular model, oops, there went my, my uh, explosions. Uh, supposedly does not reduce tracking, the point just made again by the researchers. The sixth model talks about occupational clusters, and uh, we talked about that more in terms of the uh, model of the academy, because the academy usually is designed around occupational clusters. This replaces the traditional department, and I, I, I talked about that a little bit earlier this semester, where we no longer have an English department, a math department, a history department, even a vocational department. That does not exist. 
in the academy model that exists for the schools. And the schools are made up of teachers of different disciplines. Okay? In a cluster model, where maybe we don't use the word academy, or we don't have school within a school actually, let's say, said, but rather we organize the school around a cluster or occupational cluster. Again, we don't have departments. Rather, the school is organized around that occupation or that particular theme in the occupational setting. So we organize it, as the second point is, around occupations. The career cluster units are recommended, and, and, and we have some very specific course sequences within a career cluster. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a career cluster in, in uh, health occupations would have a definite sequence of certain kind of science courses and health courses, uh, whereas one, let's say, in manufacturing would have maybe a different set of science courses, different set of math courses than the ones in the health area because they're tied to the occupation. And that's really important. So again, the design is going to be different, and there's definitely going to be a sequence of courses. We've got, again, as in others, a lot of teacher collaboration. Uh, one of the things that this does, along with the academy model, is that it reduces our, our kind of traditional turfism. Uh, we don't have, again, this turf issue of this is mine like it was in the case study, but rather this is ours now. This is our program. These are our students. This is our, our school, our cluster. And so the turf battles, uh, at least the traditional turf battles as we've known them, uh, seem to disappear. Uh, the, the researchers call this really an expanded economy, uh, excuse me, academy model, uh, where it's, it's, again, like the academy, but we expand it much. And this does supposedly, according to the researchers, reduce uh, tracking. It's not nearly as much, uh, mainly because we have a cluster of occupations. I know kind of, let's say, I, I, I want to work in the health field but I don't know if I want to go into dentistry, or I don't want to know if I want to go into medicine, or I want to know if I go into nursing or into radiology. I mean, there's lots of different occupations that I could go into in the health cluster. And uh, I could maybe work with the elderly, or I want to work with children, or I want to work with animals and be a vet, a vet okay? And so in that case, again, the, the tracking may not be quite as, let's say, uh, focused, uh, but certainly is still there in a wide concept of, again, getting folks ready. And one of the things that your researchers don't point out in the handout is that when you have this kind of design, generally you're talking about an articulation program where these students that have started on this occupational cluster, which include taking these kinds of courses and even specific technical uh, courses, usually articulate into another program it could be an apprenticeship program on the job. It could be a post-secondary program in a technical school. Uh, it could be a, a college or university. Uh, but there's usually generally some kind of articulation that goes on with an occupational cluster program because of the general nature. Uh, generally, those students are maybe not necessarily prepared to enter right into the workplace, but do articulate to another level of education. Uh, with that kind of uh, model. That's model number six. Model number seven talks about single occupational high school. And uh, I put in parentheses here the, the word magnet. Uh, in Oklahoma, we have a few of these schools. Uh, the one example that comes to mind is in aviation. Uh, in Tulsa, we have a campus that's completely dedicated to the, excuse me, the, the aeronautic uh, technician place or industry. Uh, it's called the Air Park Campus, and that is literally all they teach at that campus. They don't have any other kind of TNI program. It's all in airframe, power plant, general aviation, avionics. It's several different kinds of programs, but they're all associated with the air transportation technician field, okay? So the entire campus is based on that. In South Texas, where again I taught and lived, we had a campus specifically only for the health occupations. It was a magnet school. It brought students from lots of different schools in, but that entire campus was around one health field or health 
occupation area. So this is the seventh model where we have a single occupation high school. And, and again, usually at this high school, as it says here, it's very much like the academy, uh, but again, the occupation is school-wide. The whole school is that. You don't have schools within the school. It's the whole thing. Plus, you have academic instruction. And that academic instruction is more vocational uh, in its nature, okay? Uh, now, at the Air Park campus in Tulsa, they do not offer the academics. Uh, those students still go back to their common high school for the academics and then come half a day to the Air Park campus for their training. But in some campuses, the student is there all day and they take their academics and their technical, but the academics are very much modified to include the context of that profession. So you know the mathematics is going to be connected directly to that mathematics that they're going to be learning or needing on the job. Now, the other thing that you have to remember is that, of course, they've got to have the mathematics for them to qualify for a high school diploma. So that means that whatever the state mandate is for certain kinds of mathematics to be learned at the high school level, certain kinds of English skills, social study skills, history knowledge, in order to gain a high school diploma, those have got to be included as well because, again, at the end, the students still have to earn that high school diploma. So you can't just say, oh, no, we're not going to teach that, because then the students don't get it, and they've got to get it. So within that kind of school, you've got those kinds of competencies still involved in the curriculum, but it's going to really be focused along that particular career. Uh, Again, the researchers say that this reduces student tracking. Uh, I, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure about that comment. To me, it's almost you're really tracking these folks into that particular career, but maybe I'm not thinking about this right, but I know that's on your handout. Again, I'm taking this right from the research. And then it promotes opportunities for teacher collaboration. There's no doubt about that, okay? So this is, a, this is where you really get heavy into an area. Uh, you know, you've got a special school, and, you know, it, it takes a lot of commitment for these uh, teachers and students to really have that kind of specialization. The last model on the page, model number eight, talks about the career pathways for occupational majors. Excuse me, I went too far. There we go. Uh, and, and this is something that's now being talked about very strongly in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, later this semester, uh, I've invited uh, Dr. Margaret Ellaby. I don't have the date for sure, but uh, Margaret will be here and will kind of talk with us one night about what Oklahoma, in terms of like the State Department of Vocational Technical Education, is doing in terms of promoting the integration of academic and vocational education here in our state. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll predict right now she's going to talk about this. She's going to talk about the idea of career pathways and occupational majors, because this has been one of the um, approaches that the state agency has taken in terms of trying to get common schools uh, to consider, again, the idea of making this a much more larger offering for all students and not just particular students who happen to go or apply to a vocational technical center. So the career pathways and occupational majors we'll definitely hear about later. Again, it maintains the academic and vocational department. So we're not in the academy model. We're kind of still back in the traditional model. But we do have a career path, and that path is chosen by the students. And we do have a career uh, related content integration into the academic courses and also uh, your and I thought this was kind of interesting uh, your research is say that we reduce a curriculum cafeteria uh, I had never really heard that term before a curriculum cafeteria but I guess what it means is that we don't have so many courses uh, that it's kind of like going into a cafeteria line and you take a little bit of that a little bit of this a little bit of that and, and you end up with a smorgasbord, but does it really help you? Well, I guess if you like that taste, it's okay, but in terms of the education uh, food, uh, maybe we don't have so many, 
and that what we do have are important and focused and really help the students to go into that occupational major, that career pathway that leads them and prepares them uh, for their future. Um, so I think uh, in the school to work program uh, here in Oklahoma and around the country, the idea of an occupational major, I know in your textbook, uh, it was Grubb and also the other one uh, that you've been hopefully been reading again uh, uh, by uh, Bottoms uh, is, is at Sharp. Uh, again, talk about occupational majors and pathways that students can choose. And I think that's important. That, that gives legitimacy to vocational education. It, makes us think about a structure of courses, uh, it, and hopefully if people buy into it, it really means that we're gonna change the school, uh, maybe even change the system. Uh, this morning I talked to uh, uh, Gary down in, in Frederick, and, and he was talking about how, uh, again, our group down there, we have a variety of, of people. Uh, uh, we have uh, Janine, I think, who's got elementary experience, and, um, We've got Teresa, who kind of has secondary experience, and Gary, who works at an administrative level, and, and Bill, who has some skill center approach, and, and to look at how all that together as their research project in southwestern Oklahoma, how all that comes together in terms of in the integration of academic and vocational education, I think is a very powerful approach, because not only will it give us some individual data, but it will give us kind of a, a large picture and be able to see kind of what's happening in that area in terms of awareness, in terms of perception, in terms of barriers, in terms of unique kinds of characteristics that each one of those levels may have. So uh, I, I, I think that's a real exciting approach and I encourage uh, uh, you all down there to really go after it. And now I, I realize that uh, unfortunately Lawrence and uh, Carlos over at Oklahoma, you don't have a team to work with, but uh, certainly it's not required, and, and taking your own perspective in your own area and your own context, I think, will also uh, add uh, to that, okay? I want to refer to your textbook now, please. So if you could look at your textbook on page um, 62, okay? Page 62 of the textbook. Put this on my overhead camera, page 62. Uh, you've got this uh, two-page grid on here that I think is important enough for us to kind of consider uh, some of the details. Uh, on, on this grid, uh, Grubb has kind of put together these various models, and he's made some good comparisons that I want you to note. Notice at the top of the page, he's got listed different approaches, and then curriculum changes. And as we go across the page, then we have teacher changes, the students who are targeted, and then institutional changes. So we talk about the level of change and the kind of people that are involved with each one of these models. And I think this is important for us to really understand. Number one, again, is, is pretty much that basic infusion uh, stage, incorporating more academics into vocational courses. What changes? The vocational courses. What kind of teacher change? Well, vocational teachers have to modify the course. Who's involved? The vocational student. Does the institution have to change? Nah. Institution can change the same. Matter of fact, for the first three levels of this, the institution really doesn't have to change at all. And that would include number two and number three. Number two, when we involve academic teachers and vocational programs to enhance the academic content, we're still now still affecting the vocational program. As we look at the curriculum, the vocational program includes more academic content, either in that one or the applied courses. Now we've got academic teachers cooperating with vocational teachers, and vocational students are really the only ones that are being benefited. But when we get to number three, we make academic courses more vocationally relevant. That's where we get into that advanced infusion. Academic courses and vocational courses change, with academic courses getting more content, sometimes new courses, again, the applied academics. The academic teachers modify the courses. Potentially now all students, both vocational and academic, 
usually those in the general track, but we still don't need institutional change for this to happen. And that's a very important thing. I want you to notice here, that's a very important thing, that for these first three approaches, we really don't need to change the system. We do need to change how teachers work together, and there is going to be curriculum change, and there are going to be student differences, but we don't need to change the system yet for these three to be implemented. But when we start on number four, now it begins a little bit different. On number four, we have curriculum alignment, horizontal and vertical, lateral and sequential. Here again, the teachers, both academic and vocational courses are modified. You have to coordinate them. Academic and vocational teachers cooperate. Numbers range from two to many. In terms of students, all students, again, could be targeted. And in terms of number four, again, none is necessary, but curriculum teams may, again here, foster cooperation. So even with number four, it's not necessary for change, but we could have some change in the institution. We talk about senior projects. Now, this is a different uh, point than the other models. It's incorporated a little bit later when we talk about curriculum, but senior projects is another way to incorporate or integrate academic and vocational education. The senior projects here, again, seniors replace electives with a project. Earlier courses may change in preparation because they have to get ready for the project. And again, in terms of the uh, teacher changes, usually none are necessary but teachers may develop new courses or modify content to better prepare students. All students can participate in this. And again, we don't need any structural changes necessarily. But when we get to the bottom three down here, six, seven, and eight, we're talking about the major change. The academy model, the occupational high school, and the occupational cluster. What do we have to do in terms of curriculum? On the first one, alignment, right? We align among academy courses. And again, this may take place, but usually we've got a school within a school. On the occupational high school, we align among all courses, emphasizing that occupational focus. And when we have the career pathway major, coherent sequence of courses are created. Alignment may take place among the courses within the cluster itself. Now, let's look at the other areas. In terms of the teacher, teachers in the academy, vocational, academic and vocational teachers collaborate. Both curriculum and students work together. In terms of the occupational high school, all vocational and academic teachers are assigned to an occupational school. And then with the final one on the career pathways, teachers belong to an occupational cluster rather than to a uh, department, right? And they collaborate, they facilitate. The students, again, with the academy, sometimes potential dropouts, sometimes students interested in specific occupational areas. That was, those are the students that we'll get in terms of the uh, magnet school. Again, also students interested in that occupation. But this last one here with the occupational cluster career path, all students are affected. And then when we look at what has to happen at the school or the institution, excuse me there, my book closed, we've got schools within the school, so we've got block, rostering, smaller classes, Links to employers are important when we're talking about the academy. When we're talking about, again, the occupational school, the creation of a self-contained occupational school or magnet school, that's a big change. And the last one, creation of occupational clusters, enhancement of career counseling, possible cluster activities. These are the kinds of changes that have to happen within the school. So the model, each model has implications for one, what happens in the curriculum, Two, how teachers work together. Three, the kinds of students that are going to be involved. Four, the kinds of teachers that are going to be involved. And five, the institutional changes that may or may not be needed in order for the model to succeed. And also let me make one other comment here is that some I have seen schools kind of say, well, you know, I like the characteristic of that model and I like the characteristic of this model, and they're trying to make their own model, which is fine. You know, you kind of say, well, I like that idea of a career major, 
But I also like this idea of uh, you know, collaboration, of the inclusion, and I kind of like this idea of the academy, but we, let's not make a full-blown academy. And I kind of take things that they like from each of these approaches and develop their own model, their own approach. And I really want to stress that to you all. I'm not saying that, any, that, that you've got to follow this like a recipe book, but what I am saying is that people have learned from these experiences, and they're here for us to learn from them, but let's take these and apply it to our context. When I was down in South Texas, you know, I presented all these models to the administrators, and to the teachers, to the counselors, and I said, okay, what do you like about them? Let's make our own model, and that's exactly what happened. And when that happened, again, the buy-in was a lot better than, let's say, me, a university professor, going, oh, I think this is what works for you, and you ought to do this. No, no, that, that, that is, I don't think, a good approach. A much better approach is saying, okay, here's the information. You understand it. Now let's us decide together the kind of approach you want to use, okay? But as a teacher, as an administrator, again, your knowledge of the models are very, very important, okay? Uh, let's look at uh, another page, page um, 72 in your textbook, okay? On page 72. Uh, page 72 talks about the senior projects, and uh, rather than, again, looking at it specifically, I just want to point your attention to that page. And Lawrence Johnson, I finally have seen you. All right, Lawrence Johnson. I haven't seen you hardly all night. I just saw you on the monitor. I'm glad you're with me, Lawrence. Uh, the senior project, again, is something that a school decides it wants to do. Or it could be just a particular group of teachers who have seniors and say, we want to do this. Now, your, your textbook says that it can replace a course. It doesn't have to but it could be a major grade that will go across classes. So let's say in an English class, in a, in a history class, in a vocational technical class, the teachers say, okay, we're going to do a project and the students that are involved will get credit in all three classes for the work that they do on the senior project. Uh, let me give you an example of one that, that I know about uh, specifically uh, from my work with some teachers in Maryland. Uh, uh, in Maryland, uh, like every state, uh, Oklahoma or Colorado or Texas or whatever, you've got particular history, right, that is unique to that state, right? Every state has its own history, its own development, its own traditions. Well, in Maryland, uh, uh, they've got a very rich tradition of shipbuilding. And when you go back into history and back into the days of the American Revolution, in Maryland, uh, some of the classic warships like the Constitution uh, and the Constellation and uh, those uh, warships were actually built there in the docks in Maryland. And so what some of the teachers did at one of the schools, uh, the welding teacher, uh, the history teacher, uh, let me see who else was involved. I think the, the culinary arts teacher, uh, the apparel teacher. We had several vocational teachers, and then I think we had a social studies teacher. What they did is they, they made a project for their seniors where they took the idea of, of building that ship and, and everything that it took, and they had the students then do research and actually make things of that time period. So like the welding uh, students actually uh, created models of those ships with, with, uh, within their program uh, that talked about the welding or, or kinds of welding technique that was used back then. Not current welding technique using modern equipment, but the old welding technique. Oh yeah, and the carpentry students were in it as well because there was a lot of carpentry involved. The culinary arts students got into it in terms of the kinds of food uh, that was being eaten at the time and prepared at the time and how it was done. And of course the history students providing the background and the information and all the students working together on this project where each student would help each other in gaining and putting together again a portfolio, uh, putting together a project uh, was, and it, 
it really got to be a, a very large project, but without the cooperation of the teachers uh, together and doing some advanced planning, uh, really could have been a, uh, almost something unmanageable. But they were able to pull it off, and uh, they re told me, because again, I, I still have contact with uh, many of the teachers that I used to work with, that uh, the students got real excited, they learned a lot by it, uh, and uh, we're able to understand not only the historical, but also how that formed the basis for where we are today. Uh, it wasn't just leaving it in the past, but seeing how those early uh, pieces of work, you know, really lay the foundation for where we are today in the technology, in the advancements, in our knowledge uh, that goes all around that particular project. And so again, in Oklahoma, again, of course, obviously the land run is something that, you know, is very unique to our state and, and using that as a context uh, or, or particular kinds of uh, industry, uh, particular kinds of uh, uh, manufacturing that is unique here, uh, context of Oklahoma, I think, uh, could be used as a theme uh, for people to work for and use as a kind of a project. But that's just one idea, okay? And again, projects can be all different kinds of projects and, and things along those lines. And I, I wanted to make sure I pointed that out this evening, okay? Uh, last but not least this evening, uh, I wanted to kind of refer to the handout that I sent you. And again, for let me go ahead and show this. I, I, I think most of you said that you got it. Uh, the first page looks like this. Uh, or if, if some of you did not get this handout, again, maybe you can kind of share this handout. But this mainly now talks about curriculum and the curriculum strategy that is now needed in order to go forward, okay? Because uh, now that, let's say we choose a model uh, that we want to work from, and, and, and see, that's the first thing. In my opinion, the first thing is that we've got to choose a, an approach, decide on the design. And then once we decide what design we want, then we decide, okay, again, what does this mean for a curriculum? What does this mean for teachers? What does this mean for how we work together? What does this mean for the school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Just kind of the way that uh, part in the textbook was laid out. And based again on research and experience, this handout that I, that I sent to you on curriculum design is real important because the curriculum, again, is the basis for the integration. And by realizing these kinds of, let's say, effective or not effective strategies, we can save ourselves uh, some pain and, and some toil. On the first page on the left-hand side, I mentioned two particular items in terms of effective strategies for curriculum. And the first one is vocational and academic teachers working together in small groups to develop a program of study. I think that's real important, again, when you can get representatives from both, let's say, areas to work together, uh, rather than somebody coming down and talk, telling them this is what to do. And then also an effective curriculum strategy is to implement the applied courses, definitely in place of the general courses, uh, but also having vocational teachers, providing academic teachers with real-world application examples. Uh, as you said, a lot of times the academic teachers don't see where it applies. Does it help? Uh, it's very difficult many times for academic teachers to be able to make that connection. But some barriers, as I mentioned there, is when we place students who have not performed satisfactorily in general courses and more advanced academic level courses without restructuring the instruction. Uh, I know of one school district who said, well, we're just not going to teach this remedial math anymore. We're just going to make everybody start in at, uh, you know, algebra, no matter what, no matter what kind of background they have. When you talk about setting up students for failure, yeah, you can argue we're, we're raising our standards we're raising our rigor, but you're also setting up the students for failure unless you also change and restructure the instruction. Now, we can teach algebra if we teach it in an applied way. If we teach it maybe in an occupational context, then we restructure the instruction. But if we teach algebra the same way we've taught it forever, 
then chances are it's going to be a barrier and it's not going to help the students to succeed, okay? And then the other barrier that's mentioned there is that, again, simply renaming courses as applied without significantly changing the content or instructional procedure used in them will also be a barrier. And so we're, we're talking about, again, some, some real change, not, not some cosmetic change, uh, but some real change. If you go to the second page down in your handout, uh, it talks about, again, some various general, uh, let's say, characteristics uh, that we need to try to do or try to accomplish uh, in the curriculum development process. And the first one is to coordinate assignments, projects, and instruction that we've talked about. We need some good planning meetings. And just like with anything else, if we plan right, we get teachers involved, it has a chance to work, align the curriculum wherever we can, uh, we've got to change from the past, we can't do things the same way, and we need to enhance the curriculum through the involvement of business and industry, and finally, develop and design joint projects. These different kinds of approaches and characteristics can be, let's say, options. In other words, sometimes you've got to give examples to teachers to get their ideas rolling, and by saying, okay, here's a few examples, and they start thinking about it, and then let them make the decisions on which way to go, I think that's a good idea. On the next couple of pages, I think you've got uh, 10 steps in terms of a curriculum building process. And uh, I'll show you again uh, on the handout, it looks like this, uh, in terms of that process. This is a process that I have used uh, when I have worked with schools, and I found out that uh, you know, the chances to work by using this project, this process, are pretty good. Uh, the first one, again, is to define the mission of the school or program. That's important. If you, decide, if, if you can get the teachers and administrators to say, look, here's the mission, and here is how integration allows us to reach that mission, you've got that connection. And it's hard for them, somebody, to say, oh, we don't need to do this, or no, this is not important, or no, this is not the way to go. When you connect it to the mission, to the mission statement, to the philosophy of the school, uh, and say, look, this is how it's going to allow us to accomplish this better, then you've got a pretty strong hook. And if you can keep that hook, then the chances, again, to actually go through this, I think, are a lot stronger. So let's define the mission, let's define the outcomes, let's establish the roles of the faculty and staff in terms of, of what they're going to do. What is the faculty going to do? What kind of support staff do we have? What are the administrators going to do? Let's define our roles. And what do we need? Uh, we need, as I mentioned on the page, hopefully a common planning time for teachers, some flexible scheduling, and hopefully some training and group processes. And underneath on the handout, you see I've got brainstorming, team building, goal setting. A lot of teachers don't know how to work together. A lot of administrators don't know how to work together. A lot of teachers and administrators don't know how to work together. And so as part of my professional development, I actually conducted sessions on how do you work as a team? How do we make decisions as a team? How do we build confidence in each other? These team or group dynamic skills. Uh, some folks, again, are very poor at working in a group. And if you rely on group work for this to work, or this to be successful, I should say, uh, and if they don't have those skills, 